And thank you for joining the Oregon, the Oregon Employment Department for today's media availability. We're gonna wait just another couple minutes before getting started to give everyone a chance to join. Okay, I think we'll get started. Today, we have Acting Director David Gerstenfeld and State Economist Gail Krumenauer. They're available to answer your questions. Couple of quick reminders, this call is being recorded and we will send it out after the briefing. I will call on you to ask your questions in the order you RSVP'd. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up question. And if you're joining us by phone, please make sure to hit star six to unmute yourself. And if you have any technical difficulties or are unable to ask your question today, please send it, to, uh, it via email to oed underscore communications at employ.oregon.gov and we'll assist you. So first I'm gonna turn, over, turn it over to Gail for a brief economic update. Go ahead, Gail. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Last week, the employment department released long-term employment projections for the period from 2020 to 2030. Oregon's economy is expected to add 318,000 jobs. That's a growth rate of 16% over the decade. Now, I expect the biggest piece of this growth to happen in the first half of the decade, uh, which we're already seeing in the rebound from the pandemic recession job losses. And that's most clear in leisure and hospitality, which should add the most jobs of any sector by 2030. Leisure and hospitality is expected to grow by 74,000 jobs or 46%. Now, healthcare tends to more consistently lead long term job growth in Oregon. Private healthcare and social assistance is projected to add 51,000 jobs by 2030. That's a growth rate of 19% and the second largest gain of any sector in the state. With Veterans Day approaching, I also want to share some information about our military veterans. About one in 10 adults in the civilian population is a veteran, and about one in 10 of those veterans is a woman. And that's the case for both Oregon and the US. In 2020, the unemployment rate for Oregon's veterans was 6.3%, which was slightly lower than the rate of 7.6% for non-veterans. In 2018, Oregon had roughly 5,800 veteran-owned businesses with $2.3 billion in annual payroll. Sectors with the largest number of veteran-owned companies in Oregon include healthcare and social assistance, construction, and professional and business services. With that, I'll hand it over to Acting Director David Gerstenfeld for more updates. Thank you. 
Thank you, Gail, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Before taking questions and in recognition of Veterans Day, I'd like to highlight some of the services that we offer to veterans at the Employment Department and with our partners at the 39 WorkSource Centers around the state. Veterans Day gives us the opportunity to pause and to thank veterans for the sacrifices that they and their families have made and for their commitment to service. When we can help them find quality work that allows us to bring life to our appreciation. We have some good news to share. 14 Oregon companies were recognized by the US Department of Labor today and received the Higher Vets Medallion Award for their investment in recruiting, employing, and providing long-term career opportunities to our nation's veterans. Last year, 10 companies received this award, and we're pleased that more companies are realizing the value in hiring veterans. Later today, we'll issue a media release on this, and more information can also be found at www.dol.gov. We're also very pleased when our work with veterans was recognized last year when the Oregon Employment Department unanimously won the National NASWA Mark Sanders Award in recognition of our service to veterans. That award validated the positive impact of the work we do with veterans. Veterans qualify for priority services, including priority referrals to jobs and other employment and training services over non-veteran applicants with the same qualifications. Services include job search assistance, workshops, resume assistance, labor market information, career counseling, and referrals, among other resources. 541-VETS was developed for veterans seeking employment. Well named for the 541 area code, 541-VETS is a resource for veterans located throughout all of Oregon, particularly those in rural Oregon where some services are not as readily available. It was launched to ensure that veterans receive equal access to high quality, supportive employment resources, regardless of where they live. The 541 Vets Digital Library and the individualized assistance provided by WorkSource employees will go a long way towards improving access to services for veterans in rural communities. And for businesses looking to hire veterans, WorkSource Oregon recently developed two new services. The WorkSource Oregon Center in Newport created a recruit and hire veteran specific landing page. More than 100 company representatives signed up and have been contacted by local veterans employment representatives since the site went live. And the WorkSource Oregon Center in Tigard collaborated with LinkedIn to create a page for businesses that are seeking veteran recruitment support. They advocated to include veteran status tracking data as a way to better apply priority of service and increase recruitment efforts of veterans to meaningful employment. As a result, LinkedIn added this demographic information in September. And at the Employment Department, we also acknowledge and celebrate our staff who are veterans, their commitment to helping Oregonians find meaningful work and for employers to find talented employees is core to what we do every day. And with that, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Now we're opening the lines to members of the media to ask questions. We will call on you in the order you RSVP'd. Please make sure to state to whom you're directing your question. And as a reminder, if you're joining us by phone, be sure to hit star six to unmute yourself. If you don't get your question answered, always feel free to email us at oed underscore communications at employee.oregon.gov. And first up, we have Peter Wong with Pamphlet Media. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm not sure who answers this one, but uh, <clears throat> how much coronation is involved in, uh, in helping vets, uh, given that uh, they often interact not only with your agency, but obviously the uh, VA and oftentimes other services, depending on their status, uh, for example, housing or uh, uh, mental health or uh, uh, substance abuse treatment. Uh, how much, how much time does it? Uh, how much in coronation is, in, is involved uh, 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 helping some of these vets? You're right. I can take a stab at answering that. There's quite a bit of coordination. You mentioned some of the agencies that have programs focused specifically on helping veterans, and there are a number of workforce programs that are aimed specifically at veterans, some specifically um, at veterans with disabilities. 
Uh, and then there's that priority of service that I mentioned where the services that are available to everyone, there is some priority for veterans. Um, we have a, a lot of veteran employees actually that are engaged with those programs and they certainly stay abreast of programs that are and services available through other agencies. There's a lot of cross referral uh, and a lot of what they do is pointing veterans to different resources. Um, that, that is a, a key part of what they do, although the services that we're most involved with are really those focused on helping them find employment or the uh, information and training and services directly related to advancing career opportunities. Okay. Uh, I guess this one's for Gail, I guess next week, the, uh, the uh, quarterly economic and revenue forecast is scheduled to be presented. Uh, <clears throat> are there, uh, I know we've discussed in previous uh, availabilities, uh, uh, current trends, are there likely to be any surprises that uh, we hear next week? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I'm also not the presenter of it. Uh, so oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have been, uh, I have been um, a part of the, the planning discussions where you talk about um, the employment forecast portion of the overall revenue forecast. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we, you know, released our long term employment projections last week, the Office of Economic Analysis is uh, heavily involved in the development uh, with us of those industry projections, a lot of input and a lot of feedback from them and from other economists and peers in other areas of expertise across the economy as well. Um, and, you know, likewise, um, we're involved in their, their employment portion of their planning meetings uh, for those forecasts. So uh, we do tend to be, um, if not, uh, you know, if not aligned, there are always things that are a little bit different from, from one to the other. Um, we are keeping ourselves um, well informed about everything that everyone else is seeing and thinking in the different um, resources that we pull on to you know look to what we see in the future. So I think that there is more consistency than not there. Um, so I, I wouldn't expect any surprises in terms of them thinking that there's a dramatically different uh, rate of growth to be had by 2030. Okay, thanks. Uh, as as I noted, there as much economic forecasts as revenue forecasts. Uh, obviously, when uh, uh, budget making comes up, the revenue numbers tend to take more of an interest, or when there's a kicker. But uh, uh, economic portion is also pretty important. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. The next person who RSVP'd was Mike Rogaway with the Oregonian. I don't see his name, but I just want to still call out in case he's one of our callers. Mike, are you on the line? I am not hearing Mike. So next up is Jamie Goldberg with the Oregonian. Well, I don't have any uh, further questions, thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Jamie. And then we have Kate Davidson with OPB. Hi, uh, this is a question for Gail. Um, Gail, I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, um, if any, what effects um, rising inflation could have on employment in Oregon, whether the sort of inflation pop that we saw for the last month has the potential to slow business growth at all, or just sort of what you're keeping an eye on. That's a great question, Kate. Uh, for anybody who didn't see it this morning, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, released the um, the CPI, the um, the measure of inflation for kind of the they call it the basket of goods that consumers would typically buy. It's the consumer price index, uh, and over the past 12 months, uh, inflation has gone up by just over 6%, uh, which is the highest we've seen since uh, about 1990. Uh, so that's a significant increase compared to what we've seen um, in the several years you know, prior to this. Uh, so in terms of what I'm keeping track of related to that uh, is that I've, I've spoken in, in prior briefings about how we've seen uh, wage growth happening across different sectors. Um, you know, I think I'd mentioned between the spring of 2020 and the spring of 2021, uh, wages had grown by 15% um, 
in 14 or 15% leisure and hospitality. Um, but when you adjusted that for inflation, it was much lower than that. Um, and so I think about that in terms, that's, that's kind of the primary way that I've been thinking about inflation is in the way that we've seen um, real wage growth was rising all throughout 2020 and it has leveled off in the past few months. So even those big wage gains that we've seen for workers, um, once you adjust for the cost of living and what they're buying every day, it doesn't feel like a real big gain to them anymore. Uh, and so in terms of what does that mean for businesses, um, it does mean that they have some choices that they're going to be faced with in terms of if the things that they're trying to buy are more expensive, how are they going to, and, and part of that is labor, you know, they're purchasing both the goods that they need to, to make things, um, and also they have to pay for labor. Um, is that gonna keep going on to higher prices to us? Or at some point, are we gonna start seeing more of the things that are sitting in boats um, off of the coast come in? And is that gonna start easing things up? And so I'm not exactly sure uh, what to expect. Um, the Federal Reserve uh, is the, the go-to on this, and they're still saying that they expect that to be um, transitory, that they expect that to um, not necessarily go down, but stop going up like what we're seeing. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, it could be, and you know, I think it is a difficulty for businesses, um, especially when consumers start to change their behavior about maybe how much stuff they're going to buy for the holidays based on prices and things like that. So we could see um, either changes in the things that people are buying, they're substituting other things for what they would have done instead, um, or maybe a little bit of a pullback in that in the short term, if, if depending upon what happens in the, the different parts of the economy with inflation related to each of different types of goods. Thanks, I don't have a follow-up. Okay, thank you, Kate. And then our last question, comes from Tom Cusack. Tom was not unable to join us today, but he sent his question ahead. This one is for David. Um, and I'm quoting Tom here. He said, I've noticed that the amounts of reported overpayments, 2.4 million, are reported fraudulent overpayments, 1.3 million, and the PUA program both picked up significantly in the most recent quarter. However, total reported recoveries of these overpayments and fraudulent overpayments in PUA remain at zero, even after more than $1 billion has been paid out in PUA. His data source is the ETA 902P reports. And uh, so, David? Sure, and, and I think specifically you had questions about when does the employment department anticipate being able to recover any of the identified overpayments and fraudulent overpayments in PUA? Uh, and the answer to that is that we are already recovering some. We certainly, um, during the course of the pandemic, uh, had paused and were much more uh, conservative about any recovery efforts, recognizing the very severe economic distress so many people were in. Um, we have been carefully resuming those so that we're protecting public money, but not putting people at undue risk for the many people that are still facing really difficult financial situations. So we have already been recovering those benefits, and that includes just under $550,000 in PUA overpayments that have been repaid. Uh, another significant piece is that at both the state and national level over the course of the pandemic, uh, we received additional authority to waive overpayments when the overpayments weren't the weren't the fault of the person who received the overpayment, uh, and we have been working to address those uh, overpayment waivers that we receive. Also, for the PUA program, overpayments can be waived if the overpayment wasn't caused by the person and if they request a waiver. And so far, it's about two and a quarter million dollars of PUA overpayments that we have waived based on those requests. And then I think there was a, a, a follow-up that Tom also had about whether we'll be providing an update on overpayments and fraudulent overpayments and related recoveries and all of the UI programs in the upcoming legislative days. Uh, and th those legislative days are next week. We're not planning on providing an update at uh, the legislative presentation. We've inv been invited at this point to give um, two specific presentations. Uh, not on that topic. We do continue to be available to legislators for confidential briefings where we can share more detail about overpayments and recoveries without putting the public 
trust fund at risk. Uh, but we also know that this is a matter for public concern and we're really uh, balancing our commitment to being transparent with our commitment and obligation to protect the public money. So we do anticipate in December being able to release some additional information about at least part of the timeframe covered by the pandemic, what some of the overpayment and fraud and recovery situation that, that we've seen and been able to deal with uh, has been. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for everybody who asked questions or for everybody who attended today. Just as a reminder, this call was recorded and we will send it out to all who RSVP'd and also post it on the Employment Department's COVID-19 website. And thank you for participating and everything that you are doing to keep Oregonians informed about the important work we do here at the Employment Department. Have a good day. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you.